Today we are going back to the Punic Wars to find our next Chad Roman commander. If we are to assume as a given that Scipio Africanus was the greatest Roman commander of the conflict, then we can at least present a case for who is the next most important and manliest general that the Romans had to call upon. There is no doubt a case for Fabius Maximus if we are to view why the Romans eventually beat Hannibal, but as I went over in my video on Drusus, my criteria for a Chad commander involves characteristics beyond just skill with strategy and tactics. And much like the Romans before Cannae, I'm going to skip over Fabius, as he was largely known for not seeking battle with Hannibal and being very cautious. The correct strategy, but frankly lacking in glory. So during the aftermath of Cannae, when Fabius was proven correct in his caution, was there still a Roman that wanted to run Gladius first at the Carthaginians and shove it down Hannibal's throat? Why well, yes, yes there was. Also, as a side note, I have at this point been over my fascination with the Roman battle honour, Spoilia Opima, an honour that could only be won by challenging and defeating an enemy king in single combat. So one last time, I'm going to examine this with the only historical instance we have that historians are reasonably sure happened. This is the story of the Roman consul Marcus Claudius Marcellus, also known as the Sword of Rome. In terms of sources I'm going to use for Marcellus, I am keeping it to three. The most in-depth account pertaining to the man himself comes from Plutarch and his collection of biographies called Parallel Lives. Plutarch was a Greek-born Roman citizen who was writing his works sometime around the end of the first century AD. He is a well-regarded source, but also a secondary source for anything in the Punic Wars. Sadly, we don't have any surviving contemporary sources so it is more of a case of sifting through the best Roman historians who were working off of contemporary writers. For Plutarch and the other sources that I mention, their primary source was Fabius Picta, who was a senator and historian that lived through the Second Punic War. Along with Picta, another analyst, Lucius Canicus Alimentus, is also stated as a contemporary source. The second source is that of Polybius, who was much closer to the time period, he was a Greek historian sent to Rome as a hostage during the Third Macedonian War. He ended up in the household of Lucius Aemilius Paulus Macedonicus, and would be the teacher of his son Scipio Aemilianus, the man eventually responsible for destroying Carthage. Polybius, though, is unfortunately rather light on information about Marcellus compared to the other Roman sources. And the final source I will use is Livy. Titus Livius wrote his Roman history sometime around the start of the 1st century AD, certainly the most painstakingly detailed Roman account of the Punic Wars we have left, if 200 years removed. Regardless, any fan of Roman history is incredibly grateful for any of Livy's books that have survived. Marcellus, we can deduce, was born around 270 BC. This is a combination of knowing he was around 60 at the time of his death by Plutarch, and having the first year of his consulship and the sources as well, given the age requirement for that position. We also know he was plebeian, as the sources note a moment where he could not be consul alongside another of that rank, as either due to superstition or political reasons, they deemed it a bad idea to allow two plebeian consuls at the same time. Another nice little fact is that his name translates literally to martial, as in the adjective for warlike. We know very little about his early career, unfortunately, Plutarch begins his biography with an appraisal of the man, saying he was by experience a man of war, of a sturdy body, and a vigorous arm. He was naturally fond of war and in its conflicts displayed great impetuosity and a high temper. But he was also a lover of Greek learning. Plutarch suggests he gained his early military experience fighting in the First Punic War during the end of that conflict, which took place in Sicily. This would line up with the dates we can surmise for his birth and when he would have begun his military career. He was from an early age seen to be incredibly brave, and Plutarch lists his ability in single combat as the greatest of his attributes. He is reported to have challenged often and never lost a contest. As testament to his prowess, he describes how Marcellus saved his younger brother Ocatilius single-handedly when they were surrounded by an enemy fighting in Italy. The most important part of his personal history, though, that denotes him as an absolute chad, comes from Plutarch's account of his role in the Gallic Wars. 
Following good work in the war by previous Roman leaders, the Gauls had been pushed mostly out of northern Italy. Marcellus was elected consul, and upon hearing a new Gallic army had marched into Italy, moved out to intercept them. Going by both Polybius and Plutarch, we know he divided his force with his co-consul, Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio Calvus. And with a small detachment of cavalry, Plutarch claims as low as just 600, he met the Gallic army, which was 10,000 strong, and led by a king called Viridomarus. The armies met, and I will read the following account directly from Plutarch's biography. Meanwhile, the king of the Gauls espied him, and judging from his insignia that he was the commander, rode far out in front of the rest and confronted him, shouting challenges and brandishing his spear. His stature exceeded that of the other Gauls, and he was conspicuous for a suit of armour which was set off with gold and silver and bright colours and all sorts of broideries. It gleamed like lightning. Accordingly, as Marcellus surveyed the ranks of the enemy, this seemed to him to be the most beautiful armour, and he concluded that it was this which he had vowed to the god. He therefore rushed upon the man, and by a thrust of his spear which pierced his adversary's breastplate, and by the impact of his horse in full career, threw him still living upon the ground, and where with a second and third blow he promptly killed him. Then leaping from his horse and laying his hands upon the armour of the dead, he looked towards the heavens, and said, O Jupiter Feritreus, who beholdest the great deeds and exploits of the generals and commanders in wars and fightings, I call thee to witness that I have overpowered and slain this man with my own hand, being the third Roman ruler and general so to slay a ruler and a king, and that I dedicate to thee the first and most beautiful of the spoils. Do thou therefore grant us a like fortune as we prosecute the rest of the war. Following this single combat, the army successfully routed the rest of the Gauls, and with his co-consul, Marcellus pressed on and captured the stronghold of Medellanum. For what it's worth, Polybius attributes the successes more to Gnaeus Scipio, and does not mention the spoilier opima being obtained. But Polybius was working for the Scipio, and we also we know from the other sources that Marcellus received most of the glory for this feat, and a triumph back in Rome. During said triumph, Marcellus laid the captured arms of the Gallic king in the temple of Jupiter Feritreus. This would later be considered a necessary part of obtaining the spoilier opima. The Battle of Clastidium, as this would later be known, took place in 222 BC. Marcellus does not appear in the record significantly from here until the aftermath of the Battle of Cannae in 216 BC. Following the disaster under Varro and Paulus, Marcellus was called back to Rome. Plutarch places him in Sicily at the time and notes he brought some men back with him to the mainland. He would distinguish himself next in direct confrontation with Hannibal. While the Roman strategy following Cannae under Fabius Maximus was one of delay and attrition, there were still necessary battles that had to be fought relatively head-on. It was in this uncertain period where Marcellus would be described by Plutarch as the Sword of Rome, a nickname given in combination with Fabius, who was regarded in his part as the Shield of Rome. The two had very different styles. Marcellus favoured bold action, and as such we can consider him the aggressive foil to the caution and measured approach of Fabius. Marcellus would be charged to defend the Italian city of Nola against Hannibal. The city was for the most part considering switching allegiance to Hannibal, and Marcellus saw he would have to beat Hannibal on the field in order to keep the city. Through some creative and aggressive defensive action, he was able to repel Hannibal from the city's gates, and in the aftermath he had the traitors in the city rounded up and summarily executed. Livy describes his victory as among the most important in all of the Second Punic War, not for any tactical reason, but because this proved Hannibal was not undefeatable, and that Roman resilience could win out. Up until this point, the Romans had only known defeat against Hannibal's army. Following this, Marcellus would raid other traitors to the Roman cause in Italy. The Samnites suffered such serious injury from him that they sent a letter to Hannibal declaring it might as well have been Marcellus and not Hannibal who had won the Battle of Cannae, for all that had helped their situation. Hannibal following this attacked Nola a second time. Livy describes that Marcellus repelled Hannibal from Nola again, and in doing so killed 6,000 Carthaginians for just under 1,000 Romans lost. And maybe I should point out at this time that Livy almost certainly exaggerates Marcellus and his exploits, so we should take these things with some grains of salt. Beyond Clastidium and the defence of Nola, Marcellus' greatest achievement, though, was the siege and recapture of Syracuse. 
The Romans had suspected their client kingdom in Sicily had secretly gone back over to the Carthaginians during the early part of the Second Punic War. Marcellus was dispatched to bring the island back under control. Most of the island fell very quickly to his forces, except for Syracuse, thanks to the brilliance of the Greek mathematician and inventor Archimedes. Using innovative siege equipment combined with high walls, the Greeks were able to hold off the Romans for two whole years. The peak of the inventions we hear about was a contraption that utilised a giant metal claw to grab the Roman ships and pull them out of the water in such a way as to capsize the vessels. Marcellus, upon seeing the success these siege weapons were having on his forces, instead opted to be patient and waged war with the rest of the island first. Upon returning, he managed to find a way into the city. The telling of how the city fell is uniform throughout the sources. Greek turncoats informed the Roman general that the defenders of Syracuse were celebrating a festival of Artemis. Knowing the soldiers inside would be drunk, Marcellus attacked the smallest of the city's towers with ladders and was able to place 1,000 of his men on the wall. Following this, he carried out a full-force assault on the city. Through cunning and patience, the Chad Marcellus overcame the virgin Archimedes, and Syracuse fell to Rome. Even Polybius, who barely credits Marcellus with anything, praises his actions here. Sadly, Archimedes would die during the plundering of the city. Both his death and the city being sacked reportedly saddened Marcellus. He could not stop the soldiers reaping the rewards, but he did order that Archimedes be unharmed, and it seems the soldiers did not obey or killed him by accident. Marcellus returned to Rome and celebrated an ovation. For political reasons, he did not seek nor was he awarded a triumph. And following this, as Livy puts it, he was then dispatched to meet his destiny against Hannibal. It must be said that his life did not end on the most glorious note, looking at this objectively. He was elected for his fourth term as consul in the year 210 BC and then again in 208 BC. He was forced to take control in Italy as his actions in Sicily were officially considered by the Senate to have been overly brutal on the people there. During these final years, he spent his time keeping Hannibal in check with a series of skirmishes and minor battles. Livy claims at least two battles were fought, with one being Hannibal's victory and the other going to Marcellus, although really no great battle seems to have been fought that went significantly either way. The details in Plutarch would seem to suggest Marcellus' major victory over Hannibal in these years actually harmed the Roman cause as it cost them too many men to obtain and they were unable to move out afterwards. This allowed Hannibal to retreat and cause havoc in northern Italy, without Marcellus to keep him in check. Overall, it's clear that Marcellus was trying to keep the engagement small as per the Fabian strategy. His death is roughly the same in all of the sources. He had taken his army out to track the Carthaginians, and one day he was on a reconnaissance mission with a small detachment of troops. It would seem a portion of his allies, named as Etruscans, had betrayed his movements to the Carthaginians and they ambushed him. He was impaled with a lance by Numidian cavalry and this killed him. While the Romans did not lose many men in this engagement, Plutarch calls it a disaster due to the calibre of men lost. Upon seeing his body, Hannibal was reportedly stoic and treated it with great respect. He had the body burnt with appropriate honours and the urn sent back to Marcellus' son. Both Livy and Polybius are very damning of Marcellus' actions that led up to his death. He was careless and took unnecessary risks for a 60-year-old general. He had strayed far too close to the enemy. Livy would call it deplorable, and Polybius uses the event as an opportunity to lecture all generals that their entire career would be judged on one instance of stupidity if they were not more prudent in their actions. However, I would say he died in a manner befitting his style of leadership. Had he not always acted so boldly throughout his career, he wouldn't have been the aggressive single combat loving commander that has earned him this spot on my Chad Roman commander list, and surely that is the greatest honour. With this, however, the story ends. Thank you for listening. Until next time, farewell.